Coming up on today's Halftime Broadcast. They take and they project all of what's wrong with them onto you. And when you're not in a mind state to, um, you know, counteract that and know that, okay, you know what, you know, this is where I exit stage left. I'm going to let you get it together and I'm going to be over here. Mainly, I think people want a boyfriend and or a girlfriend so they can feel better about themselves. At that age, you know, you're just leaving elementary school, so you have that that uh, three-year period to grow into your teenage self, so to speak. You begin to set standards in your life based on alternative facts, and when the real facts hit you, it, it knocks you off your feet because it comes in the form of a consequence that teaches you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And now, today's Bible teaching with Tony Emmahale, pastor of Braveheart United. Top of the day to you, and thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast of Halftime. I am so delighted today to bring you this third installment as we celebrate the history of women during Women's History Month. Today, it is my joy and my pleasure to have my three heartbeats here on the broadcast with me, and we are talking about dating. We are talking about that topic of teenage dating and just what to expect in today's world, today's society, today's culture of dating. So join me in welcoming my daughters, Hello, and yes, even Madison. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into it. Madison, what do you know about dating? Um, I actually don't know much about it, except that it happens at my school a lot. It doesn't last for more than, like, two weeks to a month, though. Two weeks or a month, and would that be middle school age? Yes. Okay. That sounds about right. Mm-hmm. So, Tresca, you're the oldest, the senior of these girls. Tell us what, what you know about dating as a teenager and that middle school age dating. Is it worth it? Um, well, I guess with uh, middle school dating, um, I didn't date in middle school. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't allowed, but it also wasn't like an interest at all um, at that time. I did have friends that had boyfriends and went on dates. Um, they used to go to like Celebration Station and stuff like that, but it was mostly in a group setting where there were boys and girls. Um, you know, and even if it was multiple couples from school, but, you know, it was multiple kids, and they would go out and have a good time, um, you know, no different from, you know, hanging out with friends, um, but they called each other boyfriend and girlfriend. But I hear that times have changed. <laughs> Indeed, I believe they have. Indeed, I believe they have. You know, according to a report that was provided by the U.S. Department of Justice, what they say is that one in every three teenage girls is a victim of physical, emotional, or verbal abuse, not by a stranger but by a dating partner. So there are some dangers in literally considering yourself dating too soon because you're subjecting yourself to these types of abuse that could damage you as an adult. Jessica, what has been, you know, and I can't really say what has been your experience as a teenager dating because I never let y'all date as teenagers, did I? No. Precisely, you did not. (laughs) (laughs) Tony, don't play that. (laughs) Do you recall what your mother taught you as a teenager about dating? <laughs> um, first of all, it wasn't allowed. Um, like, we had so-called boyfriends. Like, I remember in the sixth grade when my little boyfriend had called the house, and he was like, who is this? <laughs> who is this calling you? And I was just like, oh, it's just Spencer. And then I think, I don't even think he called the house anymore after that. <laughs> but what, um, pretty much your your advice on dating at the age that we were, like, 
11, 12, 13 was, it's not allowed. Like, we couldn't even go hang out in a setting with friends and it's boys because you already knew it's, it's going to lead to trouble mm-hmm. or some type of trouble, some type of mischief, even if it wasn't us because you don't even like our friends. So <laughs> <laughs> it starts with the friends. It starts with the friends. <laughs> Did you and say like I didn't friends. even like your friends? <laughs> you didn't like the friends. <laughs> Well, like <laughs> was there something that I was protecting you from? It could have been, um, like, pre-exposure to stuff that we shouldn't be exposed to at that age. Mm-hmm. Do you regret the fact that I didn't let you date back then? No, because it made me the woman that I am now. Amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Like, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a big deal to us because, like Trusta said, we weren't, you know, it wasn't really an interest, mm-hmm. especially at, you know, middle school at that age. You know, you're just leaving elementary school, so you have that that uh, three-year period to grow into your teenage self, so to speak. So, Madison, in the in the middle school culture today, what's the hype about dating and having a boyfriend? What's the hype that you see going on at your school? Well, um, surprisingly, there actually isn't that much hype. But mainly, I think people want a boyfriend and or a girlfriend so they can feel better about themselves. Okay. So you see self-esteem as one of those issues or one of those needs? Um, yes. I feel like it's also something like maybe a connection that they've been longing for for a while, like to feel like somebody cares for them. Hmm. They got to learn to care for themselves first. I mean, you got to start with self-love and knowing yourself and who you are before you try and connect with someone else or else you're just going to attract in a incomplete version of someone else that's, you know, mirroring back to you that incompleteness. And two incompletes don't make a whole. Mm-mm, not at all. And it's it's not not that, that makes the bed for that um, abuse to take place because then you have this constant, um, uh, what's the word, like you're being unequally yoked in a sense. And so that's where that doorway for abuse and you know things that shouldn't happen or that you would hope don't happen end up happening because of that. Hurt people hurt people. That's people right. We don't know who they are. Cause other people to not know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think also along with that is it, a person who does not know who they are, they don't know their purpose. And mm-hmm. if they don't know their purpose and can't honor or respect their purpose in life, then they won't know, recognize, honor, or respect your purpose in life or even realize that there is a reason why you're here. There is a higher calling on your life. There is a higher something that you should be achieving as well as them. And so if they can't recognize that, they won't know how to respect that. And a person who has low self-esteem or low value or low self-worth is their perception of themselves they will see life as a day-in, day-out experience as opposed to a day-in, day-out experience where they have goals that they're trying to achieve, that they have Mm -hmm. something greater, something better to look forward to, and that every day is a building block to the next day. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I would like to say that... um, You're getting to know yourself in middle school. So to, I don't know, like date somebody, whatever dating is these days for the younger kids, I just, I think it's like it's a a label. They just want the label. Because, like, back in the day, it would be like, okay, you want to be my girlfriend, yeah, and then y'all break up at recess or in gym, 
because boy likes somebody else or the girl likes somebody else. But now it's just, it's really, it's, it's out of control because, um, like, when you look at the news or not even the news, you're scrolling on Facebook, when you look at the the suicide rates of uh, the kids these days, it's definitely higher than it was back then. And that's because of, I'm, I'm thinking it's because of, like, social media. They feel like they have to grow up fast. Mm-hmm. And, and back then we were just that. really concerned. We were just really concerned about playing outside and stuff. Like I played outside up until what? Till we moved to um, Laurel Chase. Look, we still play. I outside. played outside. I, yeah, I stayed outside. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, <laughs> but you know, because it like that's. I mean, I wasn't out there, like, thinking about boys or boyfriend this, whatever, whatever. But it's like now these kids, they have phones. So we we didn't have that. We had to entertain ourselves with what we knew. You had to use your brain. Exactly. They don't have to use that now. They got YouTube and Instagram and a Facebook and all these other different types of entertainment and then they, you know, they say they like a show and they want to be like a character on the show so they try to emulate that character or whatever and mm-hmm. it's just crazy. At least we got we got to like process what we like to and, you know, get to know who you are as a person and not, you know, like being told who you are or making up something that you wanted to be because we didn't have all the access that the kids these days do now. And that's why the crime rate, the suicide rate, and all of that, all of that stuff is peaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the term I use to describe that is the cultural pressures. You know, Mm -hmm. back when you all were younger, we used to be concerned about peer pressure because the the peer pressure was that direct pressure that you acquired or assumed from a peer whom you were connected to in an environment at that time, at that moment, on a repeated basis. But now what we have, because of the Internet connections, the social media connections, and how we are able to easily, more easily and more frequently and fluently connect with people even outside of those schoolhouse environments. Um, the cultural pressures are literally nonstop, 24-7. So there's a constant pounding for you to conform, to change, to transform yourself into something that becomes acceptable by this culture. And to also mold yourself into something that's going to fit in and flow fluently with this current culture. The word that I've heard people often use is artificial intelligence. So you begin to develop an artificial intelligence because you begin to emulate those things that you see constantly in social media that triggers you, that excites Mm -hmm. you that you identify with and you want to be identified by. Whereas, you know, the parents, we used to, matter of fact, when I was a kid, at a certain hour of the night, the TV went blank, right? Mm -hmm. It had those colored bars and it was good night, everybody, you know, lights out, it's time to shut off, it's time to disconnect. But now in this today's age, the cultural influences never stop. They come in, they come in, they come in, they come in. And then when you all were coming up as girls, Jessica and Tresca, you remember, you know, I believe at that time it might have been MTV and HBO, and I can remember a time when I said lights out, it's time to go to bed, and somebody was looking at, y'all remember that? I hear some Source Awards or something. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I was watching Taking the pictures of the TV. I forgot to cut the TV off. <laughs> you, you were watching what? <laughs> the Jodeci special. And I forgot Jodeci. to cut the TV off. So I dozed off and you had found out there's something by the next morning. All I know was that was bye bye cable. <laughs> yeah, no more ca- yeah, no more cable. You know. And, <laughs> Cause, Cause, mama won't play it. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it, it, there is a time to unplug and disconnect. But the mm-hmm. cultural pressures that that our young people deal with in today's time, it's hard for them to disconnect. Madison, is it hard for you to disconnect? Um, yeah, sometimes. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you just being honest. <laughs> <laughs> and there lies the problem. So it's not peer pressure as it used to be. Now it's cultural pressure. And in middle school, part of that cultural pressure that we see is that appearance of dating because society wants our little girls and our little boys to grow up fast. Mm-hmm. They, they they do. They want them, and, and they look at this stuff, and they see it, and they, they want to emulate it. But what they don't realize is that you're opening yourself up to emotional abuse, verbal abuse, and sometimes even physical abuse. And that emotional abuse as a woman, if you look back, if you began in these type of relationships of intimacy too soon, and you left yourself exposed to some young boy, it's the words of that young boy that began to and continue to swim around in your mind as an adult woman as you're remembering somebody telling you that your butt was too big or your butt wasn't big enough or they didn't like the way you smiled. And it's the words of a little boy that continue to echo in your mind as an adult woman, that has damaged your self-value and your self-worth for a lifetime. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's just like that. Um, there's a song that's out right now, and there's a line in the song that says, you know, basically you have me looking in the mirror different at myself, thinking that I'm flawed because you're inconsistent. And so it's like they take and they project all of what's wrong with them onto you, and when you're not in a mind state to... Um, you know, counteract that and know that, okay, you know what, you know, this is where I exit stage left, I'm going to let you get it together, and I'm going to be over here, then you end up staying in a relationship like that Um, or, you know, adapting to those traits, and the next thing you know, you find yourself or you don't know who you are again because you've gone in and out of these relationships. And I know a lot of girls, even when I was younger, that – They've always been in relationships since they were, you know, in like young, you know, and um, they don't have a sense of self outside of a relationship. If there was any words of wisdom, words of advice that you could share with your 13-year-old little sister who's in this culture, in this environment, yet trying to identify and find her own way, what would you say to her? Girl... Books. Books. Just focus on your books. No need to rush to grow up. It's not all this cracked up to be. I just had to pay some bills today. And I'm broke. Okay? <laughs> just continue <laughs> loving what you love. Boys, that should be the least of your concern right now. You 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 can think about them when you're like forty. I agree. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, you know, because I'd hate to have to rough somebody up. Okay. Oh. So I don't. I don't. I don't play about Maddie Bones. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, you're not. You're you're really not missing out on anything. You know. I mean, look at Mom and John. That's a nice, healthy relationship. If you want that, hold off. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. Yeah. My friend and I were actually talking about uh, the process. You know, when you follow the process, then you don't have to go back and redo things as you get older. 
So like, you know, going through school, finishing school first, finding a job, establishing your career, then, you know, finding someone that you are, you know, interested in and starting a life with and starting a family. When you do it that way, when you follow that process, you don't have to go back and constantly have to repeat things. It'll be less stressful. Yeah. And to that, I would say to parents and to older siblings who have these younger siblings coming up in today's culture, there are some action steps that you need to take in order to prepare these young teen girls as well as these young teen boys to be able to cope with and deal with today's culture, particularly as it relates to dating, because that is the device that the enemy is going to use to keep them off of the path that they should be traveling and the preparation trail that they should be on, and basically to derail their success, their significance, and their future. The first thing that I would say that you need to do is to heighten their level of awareness of what it is that they are exposing themselves to when they engage in these relationships too soon, that being a victim of physical, emotional, or verbal abuse by a dating partner. And as Madison said earlier, the average time span or lifespan of those dating relationships is anywhere from two weeks to a month, but yet the impact can damage you for a lifetime. The Mm -hmm. second thing that I would say is just like Madison's sisters are encouraging her now, set some healthy standards in her life. Set some healthy goals in her life and focus on achieving those goals because if you follow the process, because there is a process, you can't follow a process or even begin to establish a process or recognize it if you don't have healthy standards. So establish some healthy standards in your life. Set some goals. Know the process that will work for you, in you, and through you so that you truly can live a life of success and significance and happiness in your dating relationships. And when the time comes, you have the skills, the intellect, the ability, the insight to know that this person that I'm looking at and considering having a dating relationship with, he's ready for the rest of our lives together, just like I'm ready. But you'll also be able to look at him and see that he ain't about jack crap, Mm -hmm. okay? (laughs) He ain't Mm -hmm. about flip. And I know that because my standards tell me that if he was ready to continue in a serious relationship that has an end goal, then he would have X, Y, and Z lined up. This joker ain't even got the B in the alphabet <laughs> of standards. He don't okay? even got the A. Yeah, okay, exactly. All he want is the A. All right? Mm-hmm. Let's see what oh. Right. Look, oh. Whatever happened to courting? Huh? <laughs> whatever happened to courting? And that's the thing. Courting, just like chivalry, as they say, is a thing of the past. And, uh-huh. and, and what I see is that while some parents are teaching their sons and daughters about this, there are a lot more that aren't. Uh-huh. And what we have to do with these young people that are coming up is teach them how to identify the traits of those who have been raised and reared with similar standards of life uh-huh. in their background and that they believe in them. The last thing I'll say to those older sisters, older brothers, the parents, anyone who has impact and influence in a young person's life, bone up on what today's culture is teaching our kids. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't teach them and you don't have a method or some kind of way to combat that, then today's culture is going to be their primary teacher, and they're going to teach them some things that you won't be ready for them to know. And they're going to learn it the wrong way. And it's hard. It's hard to uproot something that's been planted and growing the wrong way, especially when it's planted, rooted, and growing in the mind. 
So mm-hmm. the, it, it, it is hard to uproot that and start it all over again and retrain it. So bone up on what the culture is teaching them and then counter-react it before it, those seeds can even get planted. It's much different than it was back when I was growing up, and I grew up in an era that's different from my older two daughters, and they grew up in an era that's much different from what baby girl is growing up in now. And all of us have to bone up on what today's culture is teaching and what today's culture is bringing because it's a culture that's hard to shut off. It's hard to shut off. And everybody wants to be a part of it. Everybody wants to belong. And the cultural pressure says, if you're not a part of it and you unplug from it, then you're missing something. How do we handle that? So before we close, does anybody have anything they want to add? I was going to say that um, the kids these days are basically like letting the, the Internet raise them, not their parents. That's right. Because what the Internet says goes, um, what what's that? Alternative facts rule. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and really what happens is you begin to set standards in your life based on alternative facts. And when the real facts hit you, it, it knocks you off your feet because it comes in the form of a consequence that teaches you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's tough. My advice would be focus on friendships now because those are more likely to last than an actual dating relationship. That's pretty good advice. Yeah, I like that. So basically, it's um, bros before you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, ladies, so much for just taking the time out to have a good, earnest conversation with your mom. Oh, thank you Anytime. for that. <laughs> I had a great time. Y'all, let's do this funny. more often. <laughs> Uh, yes, and yes, we should. Yes, we should. And I'm going to hold you all, all three of you to it. All right. We're, we're signing off. Until we meet again, top of the day to you. You are listening to Halftime with Tony Emmahill, pastor of Braveheart United. Today's broadcast has been brought to you by Next Level Plus Project Management and Business Consultants. Learn more about how Next Level Plus can help you solve the right problems and seize the right opportunities by calling 704-780-2997 or visit their website at nextlevelplus.org.